Yeah, so thanks everyone. Uh, sorry, can't be together in person, I guess, um, but uh, uh, hopefully we can get through this. And uh, if you have any questions, just just uh, um, let the group know and we'll, we'll address them the best we can. Um, so when, when I talked to Dale and Paul about the meeting and we were talking about some of the topics that came up earlier in terms of um, making sure that corn uh, actually makes it through the season and what, what we can and can't manage about, about the season and our inputs to, uh, to uh, try to get to the finish line, as, as um, Paul said. So let's see if I can advance my slides here. So, so a lot of this today comes around what can we, what can we control and, and what's important. And you know we've we've all seen this sort of diagram before, where where the two things intersect is what we should actually be focusing on. Um, and then I always like to start out with this uh, slide from Lehman Kung that just um, highlights that you know we're going to talk more about trying to get quality forage out of the field today, but to get quality feed in front of the cow, we really need to have start with a good quality forage and then manage it through the process. So um, I, I start by saying that because regardless of what we do uh, in the field, if we, if we have uh, um, subpar management of the silage between harvest and feed out, then we can, we can uh, lose uh, any gains we may have had. So, um, so I'll start with the weather is something we can't necessarily control. And we've seen what we've seen uh, like a year like last year, we had uh, uh, wet, very wet conditions, delayed planting and pineapple corn um, from drought stress um, in the same season. And we're likely to see more of that. Uh, and then as it relates to um, as it relates to the challenges of getting corn silage off in the fall of the year, uh, some data that was shared at the uh, Certified Crop Advisor training last fall that compared to 50 years ago, the Northeast is saying, is on average seeing about five inches more rain per year. And if that was evenly distributed throughout the growing season, we might, uh, uh, or even throughout the 12 month calendar year, we might think that's not super noticeable. But the other trend that we're seeing is 75% of that is coming in the fall of the year. Um, and when we think about the challenges we've had with harvest in uh, two out of the last three years, um, or at least in some areas of the state, uh, there's certainly, you know, that highlights uh, some of that impact. So what I like to say is we, we can't necessarily manage or change the weather, but we can manage for it. And, uh, you know, we can set ourselves up to still try to be in the driver's seat um, for our forages instead of letting Mother Nature dictate to us what, what we have to do. So what, you know, what are your goals with your um, forage program and what are your biggest risks to obtaining those goals? You know, obviously the basics are we need a certain quantity and a certain quality of feed. And um, another, you know, important thing with corn silage and any of our forages is quality is all in the context of who we're feeding and what the rest of the diet looks like. So over the years, you know, the trends have kind of shifted from talking about getting the highest starch levels you can to fiber digestibility to starch digestibility. Those are all cer uh, certainly important criteria. Um, but they may be more or less important for some groups of animals. Um, so if you, you know, we'll talk about all those things today, but if you're not, uh, um, if you're not putting that in the context of what else you have available to you in the diet and, and the cost of what else you're putting in the diet um, and, and what the needs of the different groups of animals are, you may end up in a situation where it's, uh, too much of a good thing. And I think Dale mentioned that this morning in regards to the protein content and some of the grass um, samples they took with that nitrogen study they did. Um, some of them almost, you know, were 
the protein levels were almost higher than what is going to work well in some diets. So um, we just have to keep that in mind because I, I don't like to just focus on, oh, this had the highest starch content or this, you know, or a certain thing like that, because at the end of the day, um, that's only relevant to, to how you're feeding it. So, um, so what, and then when it comes to the field, what are our biggest risks to getting that needed forage? Well, certainly when we think about the weather and uh, soil condition, the ability, do we have the ability to access the field in a timely manner? And that could be related to, um, you know, soil drainage. It could be related to labor or equipment. Um, and it could also be related to what else we're trying to grow in the field. You know, do, are we limiting our, are we handcuffing our access to the field because we're trying to double crop or, uh, or uh, you know, something like that. So, and then there's other, there's other risks and we could have unexpected stand loss or low, lower variable yields, especially if we have, you know, poor soil drainage and soil health. So there's a whole number of things that influence corn silage performance and, and quality. Um, you know, we will touch on uh, maturity and uh, um, relative maturities of corn in the growing season we have. Certainly starch is important. Um, fiber digestibility is very important, but that, unless you're talking about a BMR corn, that's often more driven by the weather. Um, and then crop hygiene in terms of uh, um, a clean forage, uh, reducing the chances for molds and toxins, getting a good fermentation. So when we think about all the excitement around cover crops and double cropping, one of the biggest things is we really have to build corn into the whole rotation and that meets the goals of the entire rotation rotation we have. We can't just take the same program we've always been using and the same relative maturity hybrids we've always been using and try to build the rest of the rotation around them. Um, because whether our goal is just to get a cover crop in place or if it's to uh, actually harvest that cover crop as a double crop, um, that's only going to work if we, if we take the approach of changing the entire rotation. If we just try to slam that crop in to what we've always been doing, um, the chances of success are much lower. And, you know, double cropping is very exciting. I think cover crops are, you know, you know, Mike mentioned a few potential challenges with them from a pest control standpoint, but certainly we know they have value to us for soil management. And, um, and soil health and we need to be thinking about them and sometimes maybe we can get them as a double crop and that's an added bonus. Um, but we really have to ask what our goals are with those cover crops because while sometimes maybe the total yield of the two crops, the corn crop and the winter crop put together may out yield a single crop, in other years um, it may be the same total amount of yield that you get from the two crops. However, um, it gives you two different forages. So if you need all the corn silage, you have to consider it that way. But if you don't need that much corn silage and that winter grain as a, as a forage um, gives you some other options for, for filling a, a forage need in the diet for your animals, then, then maybe you're okay with that. Um, and, and if we're lucky some years, it, the double crop will out yield the single crop, but I don't think we can count on that on a yearly basis. And so really thinking about what's realistic for your farm, um, you know, in terms of drainage, the equipment you have, the labor you have to get the cover crops done, and who do you need it for? Is it lactating quality feed? Is it for non-lactating animals? Is it straw? So jumping into the hybrid, you know, back to the corn silage part of it and uh, um, and your silage hybrid selection, um, we, we always talk about matching relative maturities to the growing season, but we really have to match them to the growing season and the crop rotate, rotation that we're trying to achieve. 
and you know Dale touched on some of that in regards to the growing season this morning and what's a reasonable hybrid to fit within um, your, your expected season. And then certainly we still want to pick out, you know, the best pest protection practices to meet, meet our needs in terms of uh, the rotation and, and known pest on the farm. But, um, but we got, we really should be starting with how the, how a, a hybrid fits into our overall rotation and plans. So just to share a little data from our corn silage trials, because it, it uh, gives us a platform to kind of study some of this stuff. Most of you are aware, um, you know, we've, we restarted the program uh, four or five years ago and, um, and have uh, continued to, to build on that. Um, in 2019, we had about set, or had 75 entries and we split them up in different growing conditions. So we get to see how each hybrid performs in different growing conditions. And you know, I, I like to list all the companies that enter the trials because they're they're really our partners in, in doing this. So if we look at the weather over the last three years, and this kind of ties into what Dale and April talked about this morning, um, you know, we see that uh, the the bars for 2019, which are the solid uh, bars, kind of fall in between 2017 and 2018 in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, that's, uh, so we had, you know, probably don't need a reminder, 2017, at least for a lot of areas, was uh, cool and wet. 2018 was a pretty good season, and 2019 was kind of in between. Um, so when we look at that, uh, what, we, what we notice is, you know, some of our major forage quality parameters uh, kind of follow suit with, with 2019 being the uh, yellow bar and and uh, and basically the the points are the percent of samples from our project that fell into those ranges. Um, so we see that 2019 just like with the weather kind of falls in between 2017 and 2018. Uh, and uh, but it's for different reasons really. Um, starch content uh, you know, we really know that's driven by the ability of the plant to mature for that growing season. So when we had a, a cool wet season like 2017 when it was hard to get stuff mature, we see that the, the biggest peak, a little over 30% of all the samples, um, came back in that starch range of 32 to 34. So that was the highest percentage of samples for that growing season, and that was indicative of some of the weather challenges we had. Uh, conversely, at, on 2018, we see that peak um, shift over to the starch of 35 to 37. We had a better growing season, the crop was able to finish out better, and on average, we had a higher starch content, at least for you know a, a higher proportion of our samples. Um, and then 2019, the peak was shifted to a higher starch, but it didn't peak quite as high. Um, so, uh, so that you know kind of matches the weather we had. And, and so UNDF 240, that's that undigested fiber at 240 hours that we use as a measurement. And in this case, this you want to look at it in reverse because in this case, a lower number is better. So when it peaks out on the lower side. It's a, it's a better number. And this is really largely driven by the growing conditions we had. Um, 2017, you know, uh, we know that real wet conditions affect fiber digestibility. We see that peak is way up here at 13 or 14, which is a relatively high level of UNDF 240, where um, in 2018, um, drier season, we see that peak over 50% of the samples were way down here around nine and 10. And, you know, I like to say this is a good way to uh, evaluate hybrids when you're picking hybrids because, you know, while we have 75 hybrids in, uh, in our trials, there's hundreds and hundreds of hybrids out there on the market. So our trials are just a sampling of what's out there. And I'm not in favor of taking our trial results and just going out and looking for the highest uh, performing hybrid at one of our locations in our trials and calling up that company and asking to buy corn from them. 
Um, I don't like, I don't think that's a good way to use the trials. What I am in favor of doing is taking our data like this and asking the company and whatever company you happen to be working with for their data. And this kind of calibrates you to the growing season that we had. And you should be able to look at any, uh, uh, any hybrid they have in their lineup that they have good um, repeatable lab data for and see how it compares to these averages. Um, so in other words, when we look at that UNDF 240 number, if you, if you wanted a hybrid with a UNDF 240 of, uh, of nine or 10, um, that would have been nearly impossible to find using 2017 data. Um, so that, but, but in 2018, um, it would have been pretty darn easy to find a hybrid that, that achieved those numbers because it was driven by the growing season. So if you can see that within the samples from whatever company you choose to work with, uh, to me, that's a preferable way to use this data. So when we think about hybrid times environment interactions, this is some 2016 data from our trials. And what we see is that both locations had similar rainfall. It was uh, well below average at both locations. But one of the big differences was the time, the timing and when this rainfall came. And we see big differences in June. And even in July, that, uh, that rain at Aurora in July was at the very end of July. And then when we look at that um, in terms of uh, crop performance, we have yield, crop yield plotted across the bottom and then predicted milk production plotted on the side. And what we see is they pretty much separate themselves out. Uh, Madrid had a better growing season, quite high yields, uh, you know, so some uh, high 20s to 30 ton yields at that location with, with limited rainfall, but the rainfall came in a pattern that uh, allowed the crop to mature, but we also see that it's less, it's predicted milk yield is lower. However, the Aurora data where it was drought stress corn, it, you know, it looked, it, it looked like it at harvest, it was very drought stressed. Um, and what we see there is uh, much lower crop yields, but much more digestible uh, corn, which translated into higher predicted milk yields. And these were the same exact hybrids planted at both locations. So we see that really the environment that hybrid was grown in um, kind of had a bigger influence than the genetics necessarily did. Um, We've been working with, uh, with the North, uh, partners in the Northeast from Pennsylvania up to Maine and, and doing these trials. And we've, uh, we've um, put some data together uh, from the same hybrids grown across all the states that are involved. And here, so we had the same hybrid. In 2018, we had four hybrids, exact same four hybrids grown at seven different locations from uh, central Pennsylvania up to central Maine. In 2019, it was three hybrids grown at eight locations in, in New York, Vermont, and, uh, and Pennsylvania. And again, what we see here is that the same genetics at different locations, there were greater differences than different genetics at the same location. So what these bars show is the difference in all of these values. And uh, what we see is that um, the differences uh, across locations. So the same genetics, but grown in a different environment, those differences are greater than the differences at one location, which are the hatched bars. So all these different genetics at the same location, um, and, we, and we didn't see a whole lot of difference, but when we take the same genetics and plant them at different locations, we see a lot more variability. So that just reinforces what the previous slide had shown. Um, so it, it, you know, what it says is, you know, pick hybrids that work good for your location. Um, get, you know, uh, work with your uh, work with your seeds people to understand what you're doing uh, and what your goals are, and and go from there. And I would say, you know, there are differences like like a BMR. I mean, we do know there's certain genetics, and I'm not, you know, BMRs work good for some people. They don't work so good for others. Again, it comes down to how they fit in your overall management system, but but we do know that genetically there are differences 
um, that affect these numbers. But this is really, the, you know, when I talk about this uh, slide here, this is, these are all conventional, or I should say non-DMR hybrids. So how about total starch? Over the years, that's been a big um, talking point, and Dale pointed out earlier how much the growing season can affect that, and we'll go into that a little bit more with some data here. But, you know, I, uh, you know, 10 years ago or so, there was uh, um, starch was, total starch was talked about a lot, and, and sometimes some of the leafy hybrids got a bad rap for having a lower starch content. But what we have to think about is starch content is just a percentage of the total. So when you have a bigger plant relative to the ear, um, you're, it, it dilutes out the ear. And what we saw in a trial we had a few years ago was that the percent starch between these four hybrids, two of which were leafies and two of which were like shorter stature dual purpose hybrids, um, the percent starch really varied, but it didn't necessarily follow by um, the hybrid type. Or sorry, it did, it did kind of follow the hybrid type in terms of leafy versus versus uh, not leafy, but, um, but, what it, uh, but what it didn't follow was um, uh, the average ear weight. So what we see here is that in, in, you know, on average at most of these locations, the ear weights on the leafies were actually heavier than the ear weights on the dual purpose. So it wasn't a matter of uh, the dual purpose having bigger ears, and that's why they had a higher starch content because the leafies actually had the bigger ears. What what uh, what the factors were is dry matter for one. Um, if you actually let it get dry and mature to where you want it, and and let those uh, kernels get get uh, um, matured, you'll have a higher starch content. We know that and. You know, if, if you're familiar with R squareds, that this would say that about 51% of the difference in starch was explained by dry matter. But what was even a bigger deal was actually the ear to stover ratio. So in this trial, we separated the ear from the stalk at harvest and weighed them separately so we could calculate a ratio of ear to stover. And we see here with the R squared that almost 73% of the difference in starch content was explained by the ear to stover ratio because it wasn't, it wasn't a matter of a bigger or smaller ear. It was a matter of how, how much uh, stalk and leaf there was diluting out that ear. So total starch, you know, it is important because it, uh, it influences how much uh, grain we might have to purchase to uh, balance out our ration. But, um, but it, you know the factors that drive it are really stuff we can think about, and you know we, maybe the leafies still are a good choice for you because there there might be more total yield there even if the starch content's a little lower, and maybe that works better for your system, or maybe you have lots of forage but you really need you know you're trying to uh, look at purchase feed cost and you need the starch content, um, so you make you know decisions accordingly. Um, and then I won't spend a lot of time on starch digestibility because there's a lot of ongoing research on this and, and it's still kind of an area with some unknowns. But, um, you know, there's two things I will say is that there is some research out there suggesting that some of these floweries do have a higher um, starch digestibility. And I think we need to keep track of that and see where it comes. And uh, now, you know, that again, does that mean they're necessarily better for every situation? Not necessarily, depends on how you're feeding them. But the other thing we also know is regardless of whether you have a tradi more traditional plant or a flowery genetics plant, that stage of fermentation is, has a big impact. And, and just the fermentation process makes the starch more digestible, which is important. Um, and that's why we want to, you know, try our best to ensile corn silage for three to four months before we start feeding it out. So moving on to relative maturity, um, you know, it really comes down to matching up to your growing season. It's going to drive, 
starch content, your dry matter yield, and and fermentation um, in a, in a lot of uh, ways because if it, if we end up harvesting at the wrong dry matter, um, we can negatively impact fermentation. Um, and this is I, this is kind of a busy slide, but it was out of an interesting article that Joe Lawler in Wisconsin put out this summer. Um, basically saying there's two different peaks of quality in corn silage. Corn is a grass, so if you want the best fiber digestibility, generally your best harvest timing is before it tassels out. It's just like any other grass. You want to get it before it heads out. But what we, you know, what we want from the corn silage is not just the, uh, is not just the grass, but we want the ear. And so we we're willing to give up a little bit of that fiber digestibility to get the to get the uh, grain yield. And so what this you know suggests is uh, that and and this was put out in the context of last growing season when there was prevented plant acres and suggesting if it's not going to make it for silage and put on a good ear, then um, perhaps you want to uh, perhaps you want to. Um, take it before it even tassels out as a forage. And that's, you know, what that's really driven by, if you look at the red dotted line, the predicted milk per ton dips to its lowest when it's just starting to put on an ear because you don't have the starch yet, but you've lost some of that fiber digestibility. So, and then it starts going back up again. So sometimes that blister stage corn that we end up having to harvest because it went in late and it got frosted early or something actually is about the worst case scenario um, because uh, you've lost some of that di fiber digestibility but you don't have an ear and you're not gonna you're not gaining a whole lot of um, a whole lot of yield at that point either. So there was a study done several years ago by Bill Cox at Cornell that showed that on average, if you increase the relative maturity by five days, you pick up about half a ton per acre. Um, and, and that is true. If you look over the big picture with lots and lots of samples, uh, on average, you, you can pick up that. But, it, but what's really important here is this assumes that they both make it to the same dry matter maturity to harvest. The only way you pick up that extra yield is if they can both get to the same dry matter for harvest. If you grow a longer season crop to try to get more yield, but it, um, but it, but you end up harvesting at five points wetter, you've negated, you've uh, likely negated any yield boost you might have gotten. Um, so this is really contingent on the crop finishing out. And this, and this, it, these numbers are different um, for grain than silage, but we're focused on uh, silage today, because um, you do see a lot of studies where, um, in the silage growing areas, they show that longer season hybrids um, give you can give you a higher yield, um, which it, again, this shows that they can with silage too, but just the the point of maturity is really important. So the, these are just a few slides that I put together with some data from previous year's trials. And I'll just point out a few things real quick. Um, you know, tw two, this is older data, but 2005, we look at different, um, different hybrids uh, ranges at different locations. And this really shows the importance of growing season. Because if you look at the top in Northern New York at Madrid and Chay-Z, um, you know, Madrid just had a really good growing season and out yielded everything else, not only amongst its peers and the same maturities, but it actually out yielded um, these longer season corns in central and western New York by quite a bit. So that shows you the potential of those short season corns. Now, are they going to do that every year? Not necessarily. Um, and uh, and uh, we see that in other years that, you know, some of those longer season ones given the right growing season were the top yielders. But we see some pretty competitive yields from those short season hybrids. And this is just kind of putting it in another um, context on this table. It kind of shows us the same thing. So this is the spread of yields from high to low over multiple growing seasons. 
and and uh, you know if we drew a line through this, it would it would go up very slightly, um, indicating that as you got to longer season corn, it was just a slight increase in yield on average. But what we see is in any given growing season, um, the short season corns have the potential to do really well and fairly poor, and the and the longest season corns have the potential to do really well and fairly poor. Um, so it you know it really is driven uh, by growing season as much as it is the relative maturity. So what are some of the risks to selecting a relative maturity that's too long? Well, mud is one, right? And maybe we have to, we get into mud and we have to raise the cutter bar um, to, uh, to get through the field. Um, I would note that raising the cutter bar can be a good management strategy if you have a bumper crop and you don't need the extra forage because you can pick up some digestibility that way. But if we need the feed, um, you know, we don't wanna have to make that, be forced to make that decision because of mud. And uh, the summary of numerous studies that have been looked at is about if you raise the cutting height about six inches, you give up about one ton per acre. And if we took an 18 ton per acre corn silage, that's about 5.5% of the yield. Um, conversely, if we took that same 18 tons per acre and we use the, the data from Bill Cox's study of about half a ton for five days in relative maturity, um, that's only about 2.8%. So basically raising the cutter bar six inches, um, you give up twice as much yield as you might have gained with a five day longer season corn. And, and about the same, you give up about the same yield you would have gained with a 10 day longer season corn. And then certainly beyond just the tonnage as we have feed hygiene concerns related to fermentation, mold holding, and mud or ash content of forage. Another risk is wet silage, lower dry matter yields, poorer fermentation, additional storage shrink. Um, you know, so we often talk about uh, that in our best systems, we should limit uh, shrink down to about 10% or so, and that's in including normal fermentation. Um, but we often see farms where shrink numbers are 15, 20, percent or more and uh, so again five you know if we're getting five percent extra shrink in the bunk because of poor bunk management and poor fermentation that's a uh, much higher number than the 2.8 percent that we gained in yield if we uh, bumped up our relative maturities and then finally frost we you know if mother nature forces our hand with frost it's kind of hard to, to quantify the impacts on that but it's not hard to see where that could be greater than 2.8% um, as well. <clears throat> so this slide kind of sums it all up with uh, some data from one of our trials in Vermont in 2018. We had the same four hybrids uh, planted in replication on the same planting date in early May. And then, and then we harvested them one week apart from each other. And we see on the September 12th harvest date that whole plant dry matter was 32.4. So a lot of us would think, oh, that's kind of getting in the range where we'd like to see it. Um, you know, we're above 32. Um, so we're getting there. And, uh, but look what happens when we waited a week and harvested those same hybrids a week later. Uh, we gained about five points of dry matter. So that was a pretty good week of drying because we often say we get, you know, under good drying conditions, we can get half to one point of dry down per day. So we had good drying conditions. We gained about five points. Uh, digestibility didn't change a whole lot. And again, this is an over mature grass. So at this point in the year, we wouldn't expect digestibility to change a whole lot. But look at starch content and yield. Um, you know, we, we gained, uh, we gained, uh, Four, about four points of starch content and yield uh, went up accordingly. Why? Because that increase in whole plant dry matter was more of that kernel converting from milk into starch to give us a higher starch content and that gives us more dry matter weight because we now have starch instead of milk in the kernel. Now do I think we're going to get a two and a half ton yield increase by waiting one week every year? Not necessarily. 
Um, but even if you cut that in half and said you were going to get a one or one and a half ton increase by weighting, and you know, and you're going to get a few points of starch, um, there's a huge advantage there, right, of weighting that week to get to get up to 35 percent or better on whole plant dry matter. So, so what you know, why do I bring this up? Because what are what are what's preventing us from weighting that week? If it's September 12th to September 19th. Hopefully the weather's cooperating and nothing's preventing us from waiting that week. But if we're out into October, um, then there's a much higher risk that Mother Nature is what's preventing us from waiting that week. And Mother Nature is going to force us to take it at the earlier date um, again. So then we're not in the driver's seat anymore. But if we get it planted on time and pick the right relative maturities, you know, there's a much better chance we can put ourselves in the driver's seat for picking that harvest date. So what about planting date? Uh, there's been some studies out there that show, you know, we do have some flexibility in planting date in terms of silage yield, um, but probably less so for quality. And, you know, we've talked for years about there's a time to plant, uh, park the corn planter and get your first cutting done. And there's, that's absolutely valid. We want to, we want to uh, get high quality first cutting. Um, but you know, one one uh, side effect of that is that doesn't mean park your corn planter until you know early June. Um, hopefully, that means um, park your corn planter in mid-May, get first cutting done, and still wrap up corn planting in May. And so maybe you have to have a plan to do that. Maybe it's hiring someone else to plant your corn for you. Maybe it's uh, hiring someone to help with hay or something like that. Um, you know, we you need a plan to do that, but it is a it's a tough time of year because there's two very demanding tasks. And while we do have some flexibility on corn planting, um, we probably don't want to take too many liberties with that. So, what are some of the risks? Well, if we you know if if we plant in early May, we tend to capture growing degree days, and these blue bars represent. Uh, the average growing degree days in 10 day increments for six different locations around the state. I pulled this together a couple years ago, so I just randomly picked six different places around the state. And um, so if we plant in early May and we're tasseling in the beginning of July, um, we, we capture a lot of these um, 10 day increments in July and early August to get a lot of growing degree days to help with ear development. Um, however, if we delay planting um, and we miss some of those uh, peak 10-day um, increments in July and we don't, we don't tassel until the end of July or beginning of August and we miss that, then we get pushed out into, um, we're getting pushed out into September at that point. And, uh, um, and uh, it takes literally, it can take 20 days um, to get the same amount of growing degree days as we did in 10 days earlier in the season. So this study out of Wisconsin, you know, and these dates obviously would vary a little bit by, uh, for us compared to Wisconsin, but it gives you an idea. They looked at optimum corn silage planting dates for three areas of Wisconsin, and they found that 95% of the max yield could be achieved through late May in all, all areas of the state. Um, so that's where that's where that statement comes from is that there is some flexibility in planting day in terms of yield because you know this this shows that you can get 95% of your yield even through late May. However, after late May, you start to get some yield declines that are pretty significant in the you know range of a quarter ton per day. Um, so a five day delay in late May or early June can cost you a ton or more per acre. And then what they also found is that the forage quality started um, to take a bigger hit, a bigger decline in forage quality after mid-May planting dates. So even though the yield stayed up through late May, they started to see a hit in forage quality after mid-May. And that's why maybe that's not quite as forgiving as uh, the yield is in terms of planting dates. Um, so this is just some information out of the Cornell recommends, but you know, so what do we think about planting date? We often hear about waiting for warm soils, 50 degree temperatures, 
Um, but, you know, just to draw your attention here, we know that, uh, you know, modern hybrids have better seedling vigor and are more tolerant of these cold temperatures. Plus we have seed treatments that are really effective in reducing uh, early season mortality from pests if that seed has to sit in the ground for a little while. So 50 degrees is considered a kind of the soil temperature you want for germination. And days to emergence is really driven by growing degree days. So if it stays cold after you plant the crop, it could sit in the ground for a while. And again, if it's protected with a seed treatment and stuff, then potentially um, uh, it can be fine and it can sit in there until you get that 95 to 115 growing degree days to emerge out of the ground. Um, and this uh, graph from Purdue just shows how many days, the number of days to emergence based on uh, average soil temperatures. So you can see when the soil is just 50 degrees, you can have up to 30, 35 days to emergence, um, which seems crazy, but, um, but you start getting up closer to 55 degrees and that goes down uh, quite quickly. Um, but again, we have tools to manage that. Um, what we don't necessarily have tools to manage is uh, is cold, is wet, uh, really wet cold conditions. And Bill Cox uh, makes a statement here that I have at the bottom that corn planted in late May under dry soil conditions will consistently out yield corn planted in late April under wet soil conditions. So an early planting day is important, but there are there are lines to be drawn. In other words, if we get too extreme trying to mud it in into real cold, wet soils, we, we may not gain. But as long as we're reasonable about it, um, you know, we can take a few risks with earlier planting days. Um, this is just some guidance on uh, depth uh, based on both soil type timing and the weather conditions. So generally, as we get warmer soils and if the top soil starts to get drier as we get later into the planting season, we can go a little deeper with our planting and that has some benefits. And then while, you know, certainly seed treatments in that early season plant vigor do reduce our risk, there are certainly other um, considerations. One is cold water and germination. So one thing, regardless of soil temperature or calendar date, if there's a, if there's a really cold rain in the two to five day forecast, um, you might want to think twice about planting because what happens is if the first water that that seed takes up is really cold water, it'll, it can shock the system. And sometimes we see corkscrewed shoots coming out of, or a plant that just doesn't grow at all. Um, and then soil crusting, uh, hopefully you have good soil health and this isn't an issue, but we know with poorer soil health, it's crusting can be an issue with heavy spring rains. And if, if the seed sitting in the ground for two or three weeks instead of five or seven days because it's colder and earlier, there's just more chances for that to happen. Um, jumping around a little bit here, but I just wanted to throw in this slide since we were talking about planting date, is planting date isn't just about corn. If you're trying to double crop, um, some data here from Kareem Ketterings and Tom Pilzer um, that, you know, uh, with winter triticale, uh, showing how planting day affects um, the yield of, of that crop as a double crop. So that's why it's really important to think about this as a whole system because you want you want corn silage that allows you to one get the corn silage off in a timely manner um, when you can still control control it instead of mother nature um, telling you what to do and one if you're going to try to or two if you're going to try to double crop you you know an earlier planting day is going to be advantageous there too. So lastly, uh, harvest timing, you know, again, put yourself in the driver's seat and really target that um, proper stage of the crop to, to harvest at. And then, you know, and do all the other things right. I like this quote out of the Hordes Dairyman article that despite our best efforts, we always end up with forage that is below the, our quality standards due to the weather and other challenges but the part that we can control is processing, fill, pack, and cover. Um, so, you know, be ready to go uh, when, when the crop's ready and, uh, and then do all the other things right after it's in the silo. So when we think about how we predict growing, uh, 
silage harvest. You know, there's a lot of fancy little apps that you can get on your phone now that you can uh, plug in your planting date and the relative maturity and it'll give you an expected harvest date. Um, those tend to be highly variable because there can be a big range in the number of growing degree days taken needed to get the harvest. Um, that rule of thumb of six to seven weeks from tasseling the silage harvest, throw that out the window. Um, especially in a year if you miss those uh, heat units in July. Um, remember, it's going to take two or three weeks worth of heat units in September to make up uh, one or two weeks worth in July. Um, and then there's a, you know, Bill Cox worked on a nice system of uh, growing degree days from silking to silage harvest. And that still has some variability, but that's also, um, it take, part of the reason it's more accurate than doing from planting to harvest is because um, you're taking out that early season variability. There can be a couple hundred day, or I shouldn't say a couple hundred, about a hundred day variation in the number of growing degree days from planting till, um, till tasseling. So if you take that out of the picture and just focus on silking or tasseling to harvest, then, then uh, you, you can get a more accurate picture because you've taken out that early season variability. And these are some of the numbers that Bill came up with from silking to silage harvest. The other important thing is when Bill did this study, he called silage harvest 32%. And as we talked about, we'd really like to get to 35. So that, so it really serves as an early warning system because if we look at when we're gonna hit 800 growing degree days or 750 growing degree days, um, that's gonna get us to about 32%. So that's when we should get out there in the fields and start walking the fields and checking them ourselves because that's kind of our early warning of when, uh, uh, of when to start looking and we we'll, might be harvesting a week later. Um, so, growing degree days offer a general guideline, potentially an early warning system to get out and check your fields. Colonel Mel Klein, throw that one out the window. Um, and then really focus in on whole plant dry matters uh, and that 35% dry matter. Granted, that is going to, um, that does vary a little bit by storage type, but uh, really we want to be shooting for that range. So. Just to wrap up real quick, this one's kind of just thrown in here at the end because we often get questions on it, is soil temperature can have an impact on nutrient availability. And generally our fertilizer sources of nutrients and putting a little starter fertilizer in if your nutrient management plan calls for that is gonna be a little more available in those early colder temperatures than, than more sources of nutrients are gonna be. But as things warm up, we know we can uh, rely much heavier on our manure sources of nutrients uh, right from germination on if it's planted a little later into warmer soils. And then another one that all, seems to come up all the time is just uh, purpling on the leaves of corn. And that can occur, it's a, it's a sign of a phosphorus deficiency, but it, oftentimes it doesn't necessarily mean you don't have enough phosphorus in the field. It means that when it, the soils are cold, that phosphorus isn't necessarily um, available to the plant. But a lot, in a lot of trials that have been done that early season, once the soils warm up and it grows out of this because that phosphorus that's in the soil becomes available, um, we rarely see any economically yield losses related to, to that early season. Um, again, as long as you followed your nutrient management plan and you, you know you have enough total phosphorus in the soil, we know that when it warms up, it'll be there and be available. So that's what I had for